Hello, welcome to this episode of the Truffle Tales podcast. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about white truffles. I've got Julie Stopforth on this on this episode, and she's originally from the UK, but now lives with her entire family in an undisclosed area of Southern Europe, where they hunt professionally full time for white truffles predominantly when in season and other truffles as well, which you'll learn more about on the episode. In this episode, we literally just dive deep. Uh, I bet you that just follow my curiosity and ask her all sorts of questions just because I am super interested. So if you're interested in this space, then I'm sure you'll enjoy this episode as we dive deep into the wonderful, mysterious world of white truffles. Uh, we also talk about dog training stuff. We also talk about, you know, uh, some really funny stories that she's uh, had and some experiences with white truffles, including one where she actually fell off her chair. Uh, but I'll leave that for you to discover in the episode. Um, apologies in advance for the dog whining and barking a little bit in the beginning, but you know, working from home, that's what happens. So if you want to learn more about Julie uh, you can, and her family and her truffles and what they do, because they do buy and sell truffles, um, you can go and check out check out more of her at palagio.com. Uh, P-E-L-A-G-A-G-G-I-A. I'm completely hashing how I pronounce that, but it's palagagio.com uh, or palagagio uh, truffles on Instagram. So without further ado, enjoy this episode and and one small favor if i could ask if you do like this sort of stuff and you're listening to the podcast feel free to subscribe also you know five star reviews are very welcome but whatever you can do um, and also if you're watching on youtube then do give us a, all that good stuff that helps the algorithm that'll be most appreciated but most and for first and foremost hope you enjoy this and uh, leave us some comments and uh, let me know how you're doing with your truffle foraging journey if that's something you're doing anyway take it easy for now enjoy this Julie, welcome to the podcast. Um, it's great to have you. I know we tried this once before and uh, yes. I think I, I completely s- failed to hit record. So we, we ended up having to reschedule, but uh, glad to be here. Let's finally. forget about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All good. So um, yeah, I, yeah. I, again, really, really grateful to have you on and uh, very excited to, to, to speak to you. Um, you know, I haven't spoken to anybody who hunts white truffles yet and uh, just really excited to learn more about that. And um before we go into some sort of, I'm sure you've got some tips and ideas and uh, strategies up your sleeve that, you know, for anyone who is interested in doing, yeah, up your sleeve, yeah. anyone interested in sort of foraging for truffles themselves, you know, would love to hear about. But um, I would love to also just dive into your your story a little bit and, um, you know, where things sort of started for you. Um, I know... Uh, you have sort of married into a bit of a truffle family or or it developed over time but um, I wanted to ask did you did you have a fascination with fungi or foraging sort of bef- like earlier on or when when did this, when not, did things start I would, I would say not at all because uh, I don't know if I told you I'm from Liverpool yeah. so it's not really kind of foragers paradise over there <laughs> so uh but I did spend time in the countryside with my parents we used to go to the lake district a lot we had a small caravan there when I was a kid growing up so I was outdoors a lot and I do think that's kind of like my element but we had no interest in fungi whatsoever um, no interest in foraging just walking did a bit of rock climbing stuff like that It was really when I moved abroad that I became interested in that side of things. Um, I had some Italian friends who got me interested in London and they just used to go and forage like out in the parks. I was amazed and a little bit scared as well when I was offered these like mushrooms, you know, that they could actually be eaten. Yeah. And but I kind of really went off in the deep end and my first foraging was for white truffles. Oh, really? Wow. And everything else is just kind of like bycatch. Um, I mean, we do come home with um, those like parasol mushrooms yeah, yeah. and porcini, and we'll also um, uh, morels and uh, canterelles. Chanterelles, are they called? Chanterelles? Yeah, yeah. And we'll, yeah so I we'll like that back. pronunciation, though. That's yeah, cool. yeah. <laughs> we, come back, we come back with those, but that's kind of an accident when we haven't found any truffles. And, you know, when you come home, you know, people will be looking for something to eat or yeah looking looking for something to, that you've come home with at least so um yeah and and then I mean they were the first truffles we got involved with as well and it's just I think it's all to do with geography isn't it where you live where you what's closest 
And then when we, it was only when we decided to take this up professionally that we had to really get into the other truffles as well. The uh, We've got like black summer truffles growing nearby and also bromale truffles. So we kind of like, we hunt all through the year now, more or less, apart from this season. And this is the time of year when we like go off exploring and looking for new places for summer truffles because it's something we didn't really pay a lot of attention to to begin with. Yeah, yeah. It was like the, it was like the poor relative of the white truffle, and we didn't want to like endanger our dogs in the summer by taking them out. But now it's become, I think, more of a necessity for different reasons. Yeah. So I think you've said you've been doing one of these uh, exploratory, um, you know. Uh, yeah. seeking for new truffle territories this this yeah. past week or so so can you explain a little bit about um you know how what's the beginning process of doing that like in terms of you know how do you know where you're going to go and what does yeah. when you go out there like what are you what are you doing how does that how does it look well you're doing two things really one of them is like maps and just different research so i'll go and like look on papers where there've been different studies of truffles growing in different areas uh, then like go through google maps and then you're looking at like elevation you're looking at what type of trees grow there mm. so you're always trying to kind of refine your search and then the second thing would be less academic and that's more like rumors uh, people will talk um pe people let's say people are on facebook and they're showing truffles then you'll kind of look at where they live because people will usually hunt near to where they are and then you look around there. So this is why it's, you know, if you want to- Some cloak and dagger truffles, stuff you, then. Yes, 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 yes. You kind of like really should keep it to yourself, I think, because that's the technique that nowadays truffle hunters will use. Um, another one is alcohol. So like, you know, getting people drunk and- Oh, right, and yeah, yeah. About where, where, yeah, uh, truffle hunters like to brag. So, you know, they might start, you know, giving away secrets about where they- uh, where they is that, has that is that technique paid off for you before yes yeah yes oh nice yes very very much so because this is why i don't drink so i can stay sober and like everybody else will be having some wine and then they'll say oh a great place oh well you know and you can just be asking questions and seeing where they where they go because ease it out of them <laughs> yes yes uh, people will use especially with white truffles i think more devious means like tracking people and actually spying on people but i think the technique of just you know, having a few drinks and then maybe people will give away a little bit too much. That's not quite so devious, but still a little bit devious. But yeah. Um, so, so how do you, how do you determine whether? Because obviously the truffles aren't growing right now. So, in your yeah. in your recce's that you did sort of say this mm -hmm. week, what does it need? What are the things that it needs to tick in order for it to then be one that you put on the good list? Yeah. So, I mean, you can. You can, oh, sorry. There's a lot of stuff you can see from maps. Like you can, and there's a lot of stuff you can find out, like the soil type, like sort of have a guess at what the pH of the soil might be um, before you go. But you can't really see, for example, like how sparse the trees will be. If they're very dense, they're very densely packed, then there won't be enough sunlight getting through. Uh, one of the places we went to, for example, was on a very steep slope, and that wasn't really evident on the maps. So we would probably eliminate that place from uh, future searches. Um, also, maybe there's like a lot of uh, animals nearby, let's mm. say herds of goats or sheep, and they're going to like, first of all, they're going to like urinate all over the place, and that won't be good for the soil. Um, if you can see like paths of animals like going through and, and the the ground is a bit compact, then that's going to be no use for truffles either. You want something which is a bit looser for the summer truffle. Um, and yeah, so you just need to see like a lot of things like from close hand and then the promising places, then we'll go back later on in the season. Another thing, we, we took um, a couple of dogs with us. Obviously, we didn't just want to see it. Mm. Now it's too early for like the summer truffle. It's uh, like the beginning of April now um but i mean they will be starting off towards the end of this month where we are uh, in england it's going to be like a lot later i'm not sure what when do they when's the summer truffle in england well July? It's, a, it's an interesting one you bring up because on the couple of um 
the couple of conversations I've had with British based truffle hunters at the moment, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, yeah, I think, I think it does begin in, yeah, as you said, June, July, but then I've also heard from uh, M Melissa, Melissa Waddingham, who um, is a truffle hunter. Um, but she says that basically, because I think it's now recently been determined that the summer truffle is the same as mm -hmm. our autumn truffle mm -hmm. in terms of yes. the species. And yes. um, she was sharing me with the knowledge that actually the summer truffle is just an, basically an unripened autumn truffle. So, um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I know there's people that, uh, yeah. I, the jury's out. I don't know whether that I, means I don't that... know because we, we have summer truffles, uh, the Estivo the and then the, the autumn truffles, the Uginagum, and I know that the, they've done DNA tests and they say that yeah. they are the same ones, but we, we noticed that... Um, because obviously it's warmer here. Mm. As the season progresses, the truffles will go further up the mountains. So the the, the altitude where they're growing is, is like higher. So right. now when we're starting off where it's warm, we can expect to find the first truffles like in May, but they will be lower by down. June, July, they'll be higher up. And right. then the Uchinagam are like a lot higher up. The this autumn like truffle, the burgundy truffle that's much higher up so but we'll be finding those in like november december they are i wouldn't say that they're unripe because the there's you at the moment the estivum is unripe but mm. um by you know uh, by june they will be you know fully mature um so it's not like you know it takes them that long to to ripen and then the uchinatum is just the ripened form i think they are the same truffle but just growing at different times of the year Mm. So, um, it's super interesting and i don't have the experience yet to talk more knowledge of you on it but hopefully yes. one day but that comes into a question i just so obviously one so, of the big gone yeah sorry. so we, wanna... we were saying about what yeah. else we what else we look for when we go to yeah. these places i think we were saying that weren't we yeah yeah um, yeah I'm and take note yeah, of the question so, i was going to ask you yeah, so, forget. <laughs> so we, we take dogs back we take the dogs with us and we're also looking for dogs to pick up on some type of scent because um, usually places where the where truffles grow, there'll be other types of underground fungi as well. So mm. we'll find some something which looks promising, which is growing underground, or there might be some immature truffles. We did find like an immature black truffle in one of the places. And yeah, or you might find, you know, some old rotten truffles that they might pick on when it's out of season. But you can see there's there's different dog behavior when it's an interesting place with when you've got a, a trained truffle dog if mm. there's nothing there it'll go it'll play around it won't focus at all it's just they're looking at you like you know what you bring me here for what, mm. what am i supposed to be doing here and when it's a place which is a truffle place there's going to be scents that they're going to be picking up on so they're excited they're sniffing around they're digging and yeah so you can tell by the dog's behavior so that's the two things you what you're looking at what you're recognizing and then the dog's behavior so and you'll then, get a sense of that behavior even in the off season when yes as well yes. okay cool to to an extent i mean um it's not that's not a hundred percent but like i say if you're finding underground truffles they they tend to be there'll be a lot of truffles growing in the same area so it, it, that's suppose it, it does make sense as well because I guess yeah. the truffle is really, you know, it's only the fruiting body. And yes, it releases mm -hmm. an odor, but the dogs, yeah. I imagine, can probably also pick up on the mycelium itself. Yes. Do you think? Yes. So, so yeah, which is arguably going to be, you know, around yeah. much more of the year, if not all year. Yes. So the, so they'll definitely tell you with their behavior if it's an interesting place. I mean, it, that, it's not full, foolproof, but I mean, you, no. a lot of this is just like trial and error. And then learning to recognize a good place yourself with experience that comes, I think. So, yeah. So awesome. it was a fun week. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and we did a bit of camping as well. So, yeah, we had good fun. Very nice. Ate, ate our first truffle. Which was, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So you did find a truffle? We or? did find one. Yes. It was pretty mature, but yeah, we uh, munched it anyway. We what, which, to eat it. What, yes. what truffle was it? Was this one of the. A Stephen. This is a Stephen. Oh, yeah. okay. So, yeah, Very they've nice. started off here now. Again, it depends on where you are. but um, And how, how did you choose to eat that one? It... Um, we just made some rice and. Um, yeah, just shaved it over the rice. It was very basic. We didn't have much food with us because we were planning to go and like just pick up some pizza or something in the evening. 
but we ended up nice yeah we were in making a, in a, a campfire well, setting so. oh yeah nice. yes yeah we were making a video as well so a, a lot of it was for show i have to confess no no that's all but, cool yeah so, is that yeah. is that video out yet because obviously no 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 because we only got back yesterday so yeah we're, i'll be working on that over the weekend i think hopefully and maybe do a few more because we had really good fun it was great awesome um i just want to bounce back a little bit i mean we're probably going to bounce all over the place with this but um Mm -hmm. so i know when you guys started you were truffle foraging or truffle hunting as a bit of a hobby what led to the decision to truffle hunt and and what was the journey like from get, taking it from you know an interest and a hobby to actually hold on this is now a full-time gig and we're doing it uh, professionally yeah um well one um how did we get into it professionally we got into it professionally in like 2015 we moved into the we lived in the city before 2006 so uh, from 2006 to 2015, it was just a bit of a hobby. Yeah. Um, my husband had a friend, this much older guy called Danilo. He was a little overweight and he was a hunter, but he wasn't doing it anymore. Mm. He was very interested in food, though. And he had a couple of kids and they weren't interested in troubling at all. So he kind of like confided in my husband and it was really through him that we started taking it more seriously and realizing the potential i think um so yeah so he shared his secrets yes yes and secret spots um, i guess well yeah he kind of there's a lot of things that people hunting white truffles won't tell you yeah obviously they they won't tell you where to go obviously because i mean this is their livelihood and yeah it's something that you kind of like work hard to find or somebody tells you it's a bit of a secret. You, um, I say at the moment here, there's probably like three or four families that were, that are making their living from truffles. So it's not just yourself, we're thinking of like other people as well who, and it's one of the lesser known areas. Some areas obviously are very well known for truffles like Alba and this, but there are other like pockets, which they're not so prolific. They're more hidden and um not so many people sort of know about them and when we moved here we didn't move here knowing that it was a white truffle area we kind of like discovered these places just through our love of walking and being in the countryside really and exploring and i mean even though we do live in a in the countryside a lot of people don't actually explore they they don't spend a lot of time outdoors they might be working in fields or things or doing jobs but they don't they don't do the walking, I think, that, um, I mean, you like walking, going through the forest, don't you? But I think people, a lot of people that are living in the countryside are commuting into cities and, mm. yeah. So I, I don't know, did I answer your question? Again, I'm yeah, just yeah, yeah. moving away. Yeah, well, that's fine. Let's <laughs> both ramble together. So, right, yeah. so th- this guy yeah. shared a load of secrets and then yes. um, I guess you guys became more and more proficient at finding yes. the white truffle and what was the yes. moment that you both I guess maybe did you have a conversation hey we should we should do this full time or was it you know always in the planning or? yeah well my husband was an artist before this and that mean he wasn't really making a very good living so he was looking for something and looking for something I think which was relaxing and uh, he'd had a, a stressful time so he wanted to do something which was relaxing Mm. And to begin with, this seemed to like fit the bill. It's another story like later on. It's not, it wasn't so relaxing, but yeah, that's another story. Um, so yeah, just being outdoors and like connecting with nature, being able to spend time with the animals, I think was good for everybody's mental health, I think. And it was something we could do with the children. Um, I think it was at a a time of, I think, general like financial difficulty, like in Europe. So we were looking for um, things which were cheap and easy and fun and kind of like educational as well. We didn't have access to, let's say, when we're back in Liverpool, we would, you know, we would take the kids to museums and like art galleries. And here it's just all learning from nature and, you know, the, the plants, the snakes, the insects, the birds trees 
And that's kind of like paid off because my son uh, is studying forestry at the moment. So Awesome. Yeah. So it, it was a... Anyway, again, I can't remember if I answered your question. That's fine. Did I think... I think, I think um, <laughs> No, everything yeah. you're talking about, you know, I can relate to a lot. And I think more and more as I go on my own journey, I think um, mm -hmm. there's a lot to be said from what you said there. Like, if we can connect or even just be outside in nature more, I feel like it it adds a, a lot of benefit to our to our mental health, to, you know, just yeah. dealing with um, life a lot better. And I just wondered how how has it been able to, how do you feel it? has improved your your life really just by truffle hunting and being outdoors from that perspective yeah, um well fitness i think we're both like we've had to keep it fairly fit and you really have mm. it has to be a priority i think because otherwise you won't be able to be competitive enough i think to to hunt for white truffles for sure um it's it's um it's a, it's very strenuous that it's white truffles don't really grow in the same forests as black truffles the summer truffles um they're not so accessible so there's quite a lot of like climbing and going into very difficult to access places um so yeah one thing is like definitely keeping fit i think uh, mentally alert as well i think with dogs something strange happens i think when you're working with a dog you you do become very aware of how of the dog's behavior it's life suddenly takes on a very simple i think very sort of like primitive mm. uh, shape and i think this can help because i feel that um one of the problems i think before was just life seemed to become very complicated with deadlines and it was becoming too stressful and I think um just being out in nature makes you kind of like rethink what you're doing and what is what we're doing make us making us happy uh, the quest for I don't know success let's say or, or money or um maybe in all the wrong places and what we actually were hankering for was just a simpler way of life mm. with a dog doing something that working together with a dog it's amazing watching the dog's development as well when you have this relationship with you how it understands you and you understand it like i was saying before about behavior when it goes in the forest you can tell straight away now he's playing now he's um i mean these aren't really important things but they're kind of like old things somehow and you do get this connection with nature but maybe with like an older form of ourselves if that makes any sense oh, it makes with, complete um, sense Yes, what we actually should be doing rather than walking around and on concrete and you're looking for like greens, patches and earth and what's actually happening under the ground, under our feet, with like you said, with all the mycelium with truffles, this this hidden connection under our feet. And when you're in the city, you're just not aware that that's even there, really. Mm. You get excited by a tree in, in bloom and there's like so much more. It's it's There's so many more levels to everything. For and sure. I think we were, yeah. we were looking for different levels of, I don't know, sort of other more superficial, let's say, levels of, you know, a better car or uh, more exciting holidays rather than looking at the actual essence of our lives. And mm. yeah, obviously, we still have like a long way to go because there's a lot of frustrations in, in truffle hunting and different other problems will arise with rivalries. I think we were speaking about this another mm. time how white truffle hunting can be quite uh, ruthless quite brutal um and yeah there's um so so it's not like there's some type of obviously like perfect world i mean nature is quite brutal isn't it um for sure Probably and the also, most brutal teacher out there isn't yes. it yes and also just just looking at um the destruction as well you become very acutely aware of how things are changing because you're dealing with it every day, every season, you're seeing this has been cut down. There's been no water this year. I mean, we have a lot of droughts uh, the last few years. So I don't know how much longer truffles will survive, especially white truffles. They do seem to be very sensitive to the, uh, the climate. 
and the, the climate changes. We're always looking in uh, in the summer for rain, otherwise there's no truffles, there's no white truffles mm. when October comes around. And yeah, so always like praying for rain. So you, you're very in touch with all of these like cycles of nature and what's happening. So. I think that's, um, I'm so glad you took this conversation there as well. I think it, um, I think it touches, uh, touches on everything that, that is, um, yeah, the, the resonates fungi with me. Yeah, fungi are like fascinating, aren't they? I mean, you've obviously got to think about fungi. What is it that fascinates you about fungi? I think it is, it's twofold. Uh, one is I just find them deeply unknowable you know you can get lost mm -hmm. in the world of study of mycology it just goes so deep you know you can learn you know the 10 edible mushrooms you should pick the 10 poisonous mushrooms you should avoid that's sort of where i started yeah. i guess but mm -hmm. then you can go really deep you can go into you know the medicinal side the yes. the, the whole taxonomy side you can get nerding mm -hmm. out on on that side of things you know having a, an addiction to name everything you find yes um, which I've struggled with because on walks with my partner or if we go out with walks with mm -hmm. our friends, you know, one half of me does want to sit, stop, take pictures, record, identify, and then figure out what the name of this thing is. But then if I did that, especially during the middle of the mushroom season, you, these walks would turn into like multi-day yes. events. Uh, you just don't have time. So, um, but yeah, no. And, and then I think uh, the whole gastron gastronomic side was a big push for me. Like, I've always been a mm, massive yeah. food foodie um you know I very much seriously played with the idea of becoming a chef back in the day but then I just couldn't justify the uh the work-life balance with it um yes but I, I still do love to cook and you know being able to find buried treasure or you know or, or just yeah. treasure in the woods from mushrooms and I think what differentiates it from sort of plant foraging or you know plants tend to shoot up in the same spots mm -hmm all the time and it you know i guess it takes a little bit away of that element of exciting or not knowing what's going to come up is it going to be there next year or is there somewhere yes. somewhere else and mushrooms ticks all those boxes mm -hmm. and then although i'm not haven't found any yet but the truffle side of things just seems like you know it's the ultimate mushroom foraging yes all right you, you'll find you'll find truffles you will i think it's a combination of yeah. determination you you seem determined enough i mean you you're putting yourself out there that you're going to find truffles so it's going to happen it's always like a combination uh, as well i think of um determination and then a series of strange coincidences which usually leads to you finding like truffles or finding the people i think people are a big part of it like i said with this guy danilo he was like very instrumental in this you know we still um always think about him um, or, uh, you know, and how much kind of work we owe to him. And I think mm. everybody has that somewhat. There's always going to be somebody there who's very instrumental in, in you, let's say, just finding truffles. But um, also, I think, you know, with you mentioned truffle hunting, uh, sorry, mushroom hunting mm. with the dog, with the truffles, it's all about the dog as well. And I think that just that gives it a whole new dimension as well that yeah to be fair there's not just one dimension to this yes. this addiction there's multiple like because uh mm -hmm. you know i'm definitely always been a dog lover as well and have, mm -hmm. have been waiting for the day that i could get my own dog and um you know yeah. what was it about 18 months ago we managed to do that because we moved out of the london city life and got a slightly larger house with a garden oh so and, you've uh, done the same thing so you've moved away from um You've moved away from the city into a more yeah, countryside area. Yeah, similar. We're not quite deep in the country as I'd like to. Yes. We're still in like what I'd call posh countryside. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Lots of mansions around us, but uh, but it's far enough away to A, have a dog and and also have a lot more mushroom yes. foraging spots close by. Yeah. Which is, although I did actually, I got pretty good at finding, because um, the one thing, thing about London, it has quite a lot of big green spaces like woodlands yes. even within the city yes. and to be fair i mean there's that i've got a really big book on uh, uh mushrooms i can't remember the guy but um it's all mushrooms that were found in london slash greater mm -hmm. london yep. and it's it's ridiculous like you can yeah, yeah. find like like everything so um i did actually find a lot of mushrooms you know even just in london but um yep. moving out now it just makes it that much easier to go and drive to these um truffle 
spots. Yeah, uh, and are the they right fairly soils. close to you? Uh, the closest area is probably within about a 30 minute drive, um, which, you know, yeah, that, that's OK. I, yeah. yeah, yes, it is reasonable. I mean, it's like I was saying before, I think you have to kind of like live close to where you travel. Otherwise, it just doesn't become viable after a while because mm. you've got to figure in all of the expenses, petrol, get into the place, the time that you're going to spend, because you don't find truffles like every day, even in the season. No. There's, there's a lot of um, journeys where you know you come home empty-handed so yeah you have to be kind of pretty central i think to make it work if you're thinking of doing it uh professionally or yeah i mean fortunately for me to, like at the moment the plan is just to do it uh yeah do it record it document mm -hmm. it and share it um yes that's the plan at the moment but um we'll see and hopefully yeah and, and, yeah Gone. Yeah, there, there is. This, there's so much unknown, I think, and and it's uh, it's. I think it's a very exciting time in the in in the United Kingdom. It doesn't seem like there's been a lot of exploration. Um, no, it's there's like, yeah, and, it's it's very yeah. novel. I, mean, I, still, I, I, I wonder, have people looked, for example, for all of the types of troubles? I've heard that there's brumale. I love this uh, tubu brumale, and, and there is a in those databases where you can see mm. what people have recorded. There's some non-official recordings of uh, the tubo brumale. I mean, it's fairly obviously feasible that they could be there. Um, but I, I wonder how much exploration has actually been done. I don't really know what's happening in the United Kingdom um, with truffles, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of truffle hunters. Yeah, well, this is the thing. This it, is it the thing that hopefully, in, hopefully infancy. I can uncover over time. But um, yes. the more I, the good thing about doing this podcast and, you know, just and the truffle forager etc is it's forcing me to try and find <laughs> truffle foragers in the uk and and elsewhere yes. but um yeah i think you know it's that it's not that easy to then find a long list of people who are doing this so it's you know it comes mm -hmm. up here and there but um yeah I, th I would imagine it's kind of difficult to make a full-time living from truffle hunting and i think if you can't I mean, you can do it as a you can do it as a hobby, um, and mm. it probably you probably it probably is a hobby that can sustain itself. But um, I wonder because they don't over there, you don't have like truffles growing all year round. Um, they only seem to be from what is it from like July till December. Then to actually yeah. just to actually just do that professionally, I think would be hard. Well, I think. I haven't fully gathered my thoughts on this, but I think there's probably two groups of people who are doing it. There's there's people who are, you know, mm -hmm. well well enough to do to be able to afford their own land to make yes. their own truffle orchards to be then yes. be able to harvest truffles all year round. And mm -hmm. then there's the people that are, you know, the expert for hunters and have the dogs and have the trained and and they yeah. can be employed by these people to um find the truffles on their land and of course they yes. can find truffles in the in the public access spaces yes. as well um i think the yeah, problem I, is that when there's a limited if you're trying to make a living like with truffles and you have very short seasons uh, i think then you have to like branch out and, and usually people will branch out and do like um you know dog training and other things which kind of encourage more Mm. truffle hunters so ultimately you kind of shoot yourself in the foot with these things you'll then you'll have more people coming into your patches and so you have fewer truffles i mean i think that's what you have to be careful of it has to be um maintained i think the whole yeah i did i i touched on this i spoke to uh one of the guy from english truffles and i was saying you know how do you manage this dichotomy because because he's obviously yeah. he's running truffle foraging experience days truffle mm -hmm. dog training things mm -hmm. uh i think you can also buy truffles and truffle trees through him as well so he's yeah. sort of doing and he's also yes distributing and selling truffles that he um yeah finds um and i i asked him how does he sort of manage that that dichotomy because as you said you know mm -hmm. well you're just going to train a uh a, a whole wave of um, people coming in onto your patches potentially, yeah. but um, I think I think the answer that he gave was a big, a significant portion of the UK, or at least in the truffle spots, is actually privately owned land. So right. then it then it comes down to 
you know, having a relationship with the landowner mm -hmm. and potentially that's an exclusive relationship, I guess. But um, yeah. So, yeah. Maybe and then that's... I suppose if more, more cultivations like a started, then people will want um, people's skills. I don't know. I don't know how, whether it's possible you know, for the average Joe like to get into it professionally in a, in England at the moment or in Ireland, there's, there's truffles in Ireland as well. Is there? Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've heard. And mm -hmm. you're always looking like for alkaline soils, aren't you? Patches of like, yeah. alkaline soil. So uh, I think there's a patch up in Newcastle. Okay. Which could be interesting. I've not heard of anyone doing that. And then, of course, like all down on the south coast. But, yeah, uh, but yeah. The main thing I've been doing is um, uh, there's there's various apps or there's, there's websites that um, you mm -hmm. probably do the same thing where there's uh, you know soil geology um, yes. maps and basically yes. you just zoom in or zoom out on mm -hmm. the UK for example and then click on the uh, specific yeah. color and it will tell you more or less yes. whether that is so that's my stage one do yes. that and then and then look at the uh, as you as you've mentioned look at the um, the google maps and with the mm -hmm. with the terrain view on to see if there's yep. actually trees trees there and you can also yes. see um i think one of the best apps that i've used all the time on my foraging trips is uh, and also just our hiking trips is the os maps one mm -hmm. survey maps yeah um, do they give you tree types as well uh yeah well they they give you the the difference between deciduous broadly uh and coniferous and swamp which is yes they don't they don't go as far de detailed as oh this is an oak woodland or beach woodland that would be nice if they did that it would um, be yes. yeah but i yeah. guess that that's an extra layer of research you have to do slash I mean, yeah but if you like exploring that isn't like a, that's not really a problem is it you, it's enjoyable no. i think people are surprised when we take them traveling with us uh how much traveling around we do in the car because it's not really a lot of walking it's more like driving to spots and then getting out with the dogs and then you can kind of like say within you know five or ten minutes okay let's go moving off to somewhere else so people come and think they're going to go for a nice hike through yeah, forests yeah. and it most of it is traveling around in a jeep um so yeah um, i mean you just prompted me of asking this question that i know we've almost got into it um before but uh, you were mentioning before that there's there's quite a significant difference between, I guess, black truffle season and then when mm -hmm. you're in the middle of like you know the white truffle season. Yep. Um, for for anybody listening who doesn't know what a day in the life of a white truffle hunter looks like in mid mid truffle season, like oh, okay. how, how do you guys do it? And because I know you've mentioned you go out in convoy or. Like, yes. what happens? Well, yeah, we have, um, we know where we're going on a particular yeah. day. We'll just, it's, yeah, it's um, kind of a bit like the war office in the morning. Okay, so um, you're going there and there. And there's three, there'll be three groups of us, either one or two. We'll take a couple of dogs each. And then we go off in three Jeeps. And we go out, try to get up before first light. We try to be there at first light. Mm. And as I said, it's pretty competitive. So you want to be there before your rivals and get the best truffles. And just quickly, are your rivals yeah. doing the same thing, tactics, or are they, I, I guess? I would imagine, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, it could be Great. luck. You could get to the next one and somebody's already been there. You could, So I might have like three spots to go to in the morning. Yeah. And by the time I get to the second spot, uh, somebody's been there, but they haven't been to the third one yet. Yeah, so there's... I said there's a lot of uh, competition. It can mm. be friendly. It can be ruthless, uh, depending on um, d depending on the personality of the people. I think that are involved. Uh, some people are pretty jolly about truffling. Others take it far too seriously. So, yeah. um, and I say when, when there's a lot of money involved, you will get a lot of people who might be taking it a little bit too seriously. Let's say. Um, and then, so we'd go out in the morning, um, take coffee with us, take something to eat, um, obviously snacks with the dogs, and then we'll stay out. If we get something good, we will come back and get it into the fridge. We get like a good piece. Uh, we, tra we usually travel with like a little portable fridge we're trying to keep them cool this might or might not be a problem in but if we start in october so it can still be quite warm 
Um, sometimes I'll stop at midday if we're sending truffles on. I will stop because I have to go to I have to clean up the truffles and then take them to DHL and they go off in the afternoon and they'll get to places the next day. We do like a 24 hour um, 24 hour delivery. And although or if not, I'll go out again in the afternoon. Um, but the other hunters will go out in the morning, they'll go out in the afternoon as well. So they'll come back, bring truffles to me, and then they will stay out until it's time to come home, till it's dark. And then we come back, we put our haul, like see what everyone's got. There's like a lot of rivalry between us as well. So, um, oh, this, there's a, I have a funny story about this as well. Yeah, yeah. Because we're looking for the best, obviously the best truffle is the biggest truffle, but even there are other like categories of truffle that chefs particularly want. So the chefs tend to prefer the smooth, like smooth ones, smooth and round. Okay. I think that's because there's not as much soil can get into the like nooks and crannies because like you've seen white truffles, they can be very strange shaped like brains. Yeah. Or, like, big, yeah. So um, one time my husband came back, I will also like joke around with each other. You know, I didn't get anything. And then you pull out, ha ah, ha, I got this. Ah. Yeah. Then there's, I say there's rival between us as well. And um, my husband came back and he said, oh, I didn't get anything today. And um we work with his brother as well and his brother had he'd found a few small ones and uh, then my husband like pulled up this perfect specimen it was like golden round it was probably worth I think it was in it was in 2019 so there weren't many truffles that year so this was probably about a thousand quids worth of truffle and wow. he said I just found this potato and his brother <laughs> he'd only been doing it for a couple of years and he went took out his hand and went Oh, potato and like chucked it on the ground and smashed it into oh no pieces. yeah oh, no. so that was like sort of like setting fire to like 500 euros oh and, um, <laughs> yeah so we, we laughed about it later but i think we beat him up first afterwards yeah. and i think we also beat up my husband as well because making a stupid joke on his brother's a bit he's a few <laughs> He's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, his brother. So, uh, <laughs> he can't speak English, so I can say this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you don't play tricks like that on people like that. No. But, um, yeah, so then we come home and then we, like, have something to do, eat. Do you, do you only buy him a potato for Christmas <laughs> like, <laughs> nowadays? <laughs> like, that's yeah, all you're getting. So, yeah, so we call, like, the perfect the perfect truffle is referred to, like, as a potato because it's, it looks like a potato, you know, so... Um, yeah, looked like an, a nice shiny King Eddie. That. Oh, nice. But um, yeah, I think our biggest truffle we found was like half a kilo. We've had it because wow. there's quite a few of us will get, uh, and it depends on the year. Last year was a really good year. It was a bad year for truffles, but it was a good year for prices. But um, yeah, th th we'll say we come back. Uh, take care of the dogs we've got like seven dogs so oh really wow and then yeah and then my brother-in-law he has another two so we're working like with a choice of nine dogs so we can keep them uh, rested yeah and, yeah that's going to yeah. be my question because it sounds like an all-day yeah. event but um i guess is, with multiple dogs you yes you know you're not uh, overworking yeah, them and perhaps. yeah and then sometimes uh there's a couple of the female dogs that might be in heat so they like get left behind um and yeah, so then we come back, have a shower, uh, maybe go out for some treat, and then start again the next day. And that goes on like every day. If it rains, we get to stay home, but you're waiting for the rain to stop so you can get out. This is like it's the most exciting time of the year. It's really exciting. You start getting excited in the end of July. Oh, you know, the season's coming up. And obviously, a big part of it is the money. I'm not going to lie to you. It's, yeah, you know, there's big money involved, but it's also, it is just very exciting watching the dog pick up the scent. And it runs off and you're chasing after the dog. And some of the dogs will sit there and then some of the dogs will start to actually dig. And I think you yeah. need dogs who dig when you're dealing with white truffles because yeah. they can be very deep. Mm. And it would just, it, it's very tiring. I mean, I'm not like, um, I'm not as young as I was. So I don't have like as much stamina as, um, you know, a younger what, person to be digging around all day. What's, so the the dogs what's the average sort of depth that you find, your, or what's the deepest um, one you found? Like, the deepest one was half a metre. Okay. Well. Uh, I think I've got a video of that, like actually trying to get that one out. And they can, it can be hard work. They can be tangled up in roots. They can be growing around roots, and you're really trying not to break them. 
or mm. scratch them hopefully because that will reduce the the value of the truffle <laughs> you really want to get it out intact and preferably not scratched but you want to be out all day so if i was like doing a lot of digging myself and we only have like very small tools obviously we don't want to make, make a big hole yeah a huge big crater so the dog we get the dog to dig like right on the spot and then we will you know stop the dog the dog most of our dogs know when to stop and then you know we finish the rest of the job like with our little vanguette or those little like digging tools mm. um yeah so sorry what did you no, ask me i forgot i was again. i was gonna <laughs> ask you a specific question perfect timing yeah. so okay on on this it, well i don't know it if it's, a, it's about dogs yeah about dog training yes. thing on this i don't know if it's a debate or um it's just something mm -hmm. i've read about i'm not sure like what's the right answer what to do do you yeah. teach your dog to dig or or do you teach them to indicate in another way um i have a bit of an answer but what is it that and you say your many of your dogs now they just know what to do but in the stages yes. when they they don't necessarily know what to do what are you, you doing well you've, to got, help to always train be, you've got to always be on top of the dog i think yeah. this is why i think it's a good idea if you've got like fast dogs you've got to be pretty fast so you see he's looking for you um and or he started to dig like we have a wirehead pointer who's like a really wild dog i never got that dog because i can't control it i can't keep it off the truffle um, um my son can but he's like you know he's 20 and he's like you know six foot four so right. he's uh so you mean like physically you know, he, he keep him off the truffle yes, right okay the truffle. it's going to be a great dog but it's just a, a bit mad yeah um so yeah um again i'm gonna to have to ask you the question was again sorry about my early on right, i'm, on I'm just trying to get a bit of um yeah should, expert should dog training advice dig? on yes. on on do you teach them to dig do you not yeah. and if you do how would you teach them to do it in the right way so they know when to stop or right they get the feeling yes. so i think yeah that they should know how to dig especially if you're looking for white truffles because it's far too tiring i think to do the digging so we've got dogs with big paws yeah, I I don't understand how people use like legato because they just seem to be too small and um, mm. that they 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 couldn't do the job seriously. I don't think, but obviously I'm wrong because a lot of people use like legato and to great success. But um, our dogs generally have like big paws, like the wirehead pointer that we have, and um, you know when we're choosing to keep a dog, let's say of a litter, we'll go for the ones with the big paws yeah. because they're, they're good diggers. But yeah, um, you have to be on top of the dog all the time. You'll chase after the dog when it starts to dig. And, you know, you'll just back it away and then give it the reward after a certain point. Then you might call it in again, but then you say, stop. When it stops, you give them the reward. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're looking around, you're smelling the soil. And then, you know, when you see it starts to, you know, poke out, you've got to stop the dog then. You don't want to, the dog's paws to, to break it. But um also, the, the dog's going to be very specific about where to dig. If he's just indicating, I mean, I don't know, you'd be, you're probably going to be damaging far more of the the, the soil and, you know, the, the area. You, you do want to keep your digging and your damage to, to a minimum. And I think with the, when the dog's digging, that's what's happening. If it just indicates, surely there's a far larger area mm. that you have to actually start disturbing and then the other thing that we always have to say is you always must cover the hole. It's very, it's it's vital that everything goes back in the hole. And that, like, obviously for two reasons, you don't want people to know that you've been there, that this is a truffle area. And then yeah. also to keep everything protected, like inside the spores yeah. and all the other things. So, yeah. Uh, what was your view anyway? You said you had a theory on this. What do you think about digging? So I think when I first read somebody who had a dog and they um they taught it to dig it dig at the truffles you know they were um the problem was they were scratching and damaging the the truffle and mm -hmm. it was hard to teach unwind that teaching um right but then i think my view is like as as you said you can mm -hmm. you can get them to to dig um but as long as they have the ability to to stop on command yes. um then it shouldn't be an issue um i i've also gone deep on doing like followed some people who do sort of more um uh more dog training agility scent stuff mm -hmm. in not in the truffle foraging space yeah. but and they're just in the more scent detection and um i went down this route of uh you know getting um 
a dog to indicate because yes one of the things that this chap i uh, forget his name but he was talking about it only really takes two behaviors to to get a dog to hunt for something to identify something or whatever or to basically find a truffle mm -hmm. one is they need to be able to scent detect you know smell yeah. the difference between you know a truffle and a peach or whatever it is yes uh, and then also the next one is they need to be able to indicate whether that mm -hmm. is by digging or putting their nose or lying down one yeah. of those behaviors is natural to them uh, mm -hmm. and the other one is not natural indicating on something is 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 sort of the arguably the harder skill to to train so for several months i actually just started trying to train that into buddy yeah and i haven't haven't gone back to it because i've sort of just um got him to go into the go into the woods and stuff and just and just yeah. find stuff by, by digging because i felt like i could also train him to stop digging when i needed to um yes. but as you said even though it's black truffle or uh it's not a white truffle we'd probably end up finding in the uk but um still they're probably gonna be I, don't, under the I don't know how shallow they are i mean how it's if they're if they're fairly shallow then there's always going to be a danger of them scratching them i think you know when mm. we're doing with the black summer truffles um they do tend to get scratched by the dogs they have got like big paws and big nails and things so yeah yeah um but as I said, we're not dog trainers. I mean, we're truffle hunters. We've just trained a lot of dogs, really. Yeah. So it's just, it's all kind of like really anecdotal. There's no science really behind what we do. It's just what And I imagine, what I imagine do. a, I imagine a new, a new dog or a puppy or whatever coming into your mm -hmm. system now. Yeah. I imagine the, the progression is far, far quicker because it's got yes. seven to 10 other yeah. dogs it can learn from showing it what to yeah, do yeah. yeah which i imagine is worth its weight in gold it is um, it is i mean that, that's there, i think yeah. if you get stuck at the end you always have to revert to that as somebody got a dog who's prepared to take me out and show my dog because some dogs just get stuck at the end you know mm. they can't find the dog they can't find truffles out in the wild you'd be taking them to places where there are truffles and for whatever reason um they're not finding them and you take another dog who knows if you can get one if you can get somebody who will do that for you but it probably won't come to that. No, um, oh. I have every confidence in myself, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, by speaking to and Buddy, yeah, yeah he's, the only thing that I think I have to control with him is, is a bit like you explaining with your wide-haired pointer. Is he's very he's very leggy. He's very quick. He'll if yes. we're playing find it games inside or outside he'll mm -hmm. you know he'll be moving quite quickly over a large space so um i speak to another uh forager in the uk he he said solution with that is just put him on the lead and just you know guide him around mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether you had uh the similar thoughts or su would suggest something different or no we, we tend to learn uh let the dogs off and then off. they will just sit where they find a truffle. Yeah, but we can hear. I don't know. It depends on, I suppose, the the laws and the rules of the area where you are. It'd be different. Mm. But yeah, our dogs well, I guess my I guess my concern off. would be is if he's you know sprinting everywhere and yes. he's, he's he's arguably he's going too fast to maybe pick up on scents and maybe he might miss a truffle scent. But if we're going a bit more methodical and more slowly, or if he mm -hmm. was actually just yeah. a bit more of a yes steady eddie in terms of the way he sniffed around yeah. trees he probably would not miss anything but it's all but hypothetical yeah, but moment, he'll, but. <laughs> he'll, cover, he'll cover a larger area yeah we we tend to work with two types of dog um like a sort of more medium range dog who will work closer to you mm. and then um we have these very leggy athletic sort of like pointers who will run off and cover larger like areas um and so then, you got the best of both worlds, really. Yes. Yeah, nice. Yes. You thought it all through. <laughs> it's, all, it's all been thought through. Yeah. And then, I mean, ideally, we'd have like a very small little dog that would just stay around your feet and follow you around. And but it, it's hard to keep because you've got to keep on top of both of them. So Ooh, it's a bit yeah. of a headache doing it that way. Yeah. Yeah. There's it, it can be an awful headache. You know, I I I myself uh, would just go out with one dog. And I have the, the one I have that I take the best dog as well, who doesn't miss things. And it's fairly slow because I just can't keep up or I could keep up, for, but it would only be for about an hour. And then I'll be useless and be probably sent home. In a and what, what makes your dog the best dog just in terms uh, of the results? Or? Oh, she's just very, very smart. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think she's probably she will have unearthed over 100 kilos of white truffle like in the last few years. Um, wow. She 
doesn't miss a truffle. She, I think it's, again, it's just to do with the relationship. She will look at me and I know that she's got something and she will show me where it is, you know, she will then walk back to it. Um, she's a very serious dog, um, sensible. She helps the other dogs. She won't go around and like play with the younger dogs. She's the mother of um, most of our dogs that we have at the moment. She's the mother of, obviously not the wire-haired pointer, but she's the mother of four. Yeah, Ragnar mm. and yeah, four. And, um, and what 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 dogs are they? What breed? What? She, uh, she's just a uh, regular unknown ground. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who she is. No. Yeah, and we just train ourselves. And then we have a more professional dog. We, he's supposed to be a, a Italian Brack pointer, but I mm. don't think he is. But he's um, he's also a great dog, but he tends to run around a lot. And then we experimented with the wirehead pointer because they seem to combine everything, mm. the strength and the stamina, again, to, to be white truffle hunters because they, yeah, they, they need to be able to keep going and to enjoy it, obviously, you know, it's not. Um, uh, and Betty, she's the wirehead pointer. I mean, she, she loves it, but she will bring you truffles in her mouth, which you don't really want her to do because mm. it means that the holes have been left so we're trying to stop her from doing that. But um, like I say, it's a, it's a very difficult dog to train. I didn't realize what we were kind of getting in into. What uh, are you doing to try and to stop her from doing that? Um, at the moment, I don't know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, sure. I just, it's like my son's problem. You know, you can, you can deal with Betty. Um, but she used to bring uh, tortoises as well. She would bring all kinds of things back, retrieve Funny. things. So yeah, we had a lot of like undesirable behaviors from the dog, but uh, she's she's a real fun dog to have. Oh, that, oh that's the doorbell's just gone. Yeah, 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 exactly. We're talking about dogs and truffles. Right. Um, I was wanting to ask you, um, what is what is the main way what? that uh, truffle hunting families or teams um, in your area then distribute? the truffles and and because you mentioned okay. uh, D, yeah. dhl and 24 hours later yes. but then my head is you know having recently watched the truffle hunters movie you know there's yes. there's there's like a there's a middleman who deals with all the yes. you know the truffle yes. hunters in the in the mountains yeah. and stuff like what what is the normal and then what is it okay. that you do um the normal is is that that twice a week um, a guy will come round to all the truffle hunters' houses with his van and he'll pick up all of the truffles, all the white truffles. Mm. Um, and, I mean, or you might have your own man and go out and, like, find him. I mean, we do have, like, we'll have a few customers, or we, we did have a few customers uh, in, in London or in, in England um, that we would send to, or because they have, like, a site and we would send some from there, but mostly... The, the day's catch would be just kept in the fridge until the guy came along and then he takes them to the next guy and then they get sent all around the world. So that's, yeah, I think um, the, I don't think people realize how old truffles are by the time they get to, mm. the time they get abroad. I think, um, let's say in the States, they'd probably be better off eating their own truffles. They're gonna taste a lot better regardless of the species, I think just because truffles don't last that long. I mean, the shelf life on them. And I mean, I, I know ourselves, you know, let's say on the truffles will leave usually on a, on a Thursday. That's just going to be logistics. And so Friday, Saturday and Sunday's truffles get picked up on Monday. So they're yeah. going to be like, you know, three, four days old by the time they get to the next guy. And then I don't know how long. I don't really know what happens to them after that. Uh, so when we're sending them to people, we'll always like send that days. I think it's just like a matter of pride to be able to get some. This is what a truffle should taste like—a fresh truffle. Because I don't think a lot of people get that experience, and it is—it is a great experience. I mean, obviously, like with the white truffle, a lot of it is hype. I mean, it, it, it started off as just like great marketing, but they are a very unique flavor. They're, they are something very special, I think, to eat. Um, we obviously don't get to eat a lot of them. We, you know, our, our purpose is to collect them, to sell them to people who can afford to eat them. Mm. Um, and 
yeah, if there's any left over, if it's a good year, we have a glut, we, we will eat them. Um, but our purpose is, is to sell them. But I can see why people do make a big deal uh, out of them, that, you know, they are something else. So. How do you, how do you, because I've heard it described in a few different ways. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you describe the, the flavor or the, you know, the sensation you get from eating the, the white truffle? I think that the reason that there's different um, descriptions is that some people just don't like them at all. They just don't like the smell. Um, uh, in 2019, I was in Liverpool and I took a load of truffles with me and I had them in my mum's fridge and she was going mad. God, get these out. They stink. These disgusting things. Oh, God. I didn't want anything to do with them. Gave some to my uncle. The same thing. Jesus, not having this. Horrible. Yeah. And whereas people who love them, I think there's something like people talk about the sexual side of things, I think it really is something that people can get hooked on. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, the, the usual things like garlic, whatever, it's, it's, that's why I think they are as expensive as they are. They're, they're something which is a little bit beyond description. Um, they're, they're not akin to anything else. Just like, you know, take a, a mushroom and magnify it a couple of thousand times with throwing some garlic, brandy, cream, hazelnuts. Um, and then people always talk about, you know, the, the, like the sexual side of things as well. So obviously that plays a big part in their reproduction, doesn't it? Making them sexy to pigs. So mm. there's probably something in that as well. That people just smell them and think, but um. I think I told you last time, <laughs> the first time I ate a truffle, I actually fell off a stool. Oh, yeah. First time I, I tried a white truffle that. because it was, yeah, it was, um, it was like being punched in the face or something. It was just so powerful and strange. R remind so. me again, what, what was the, uh, what was the um, situation you were in and then what was the dish that you got served? And It was a creamy pasta, I think. Yeah, and like some fresh pasta and just truffle like shaved on the top and I think just holding like a fork to my nose and we were sitting we was we were fairly high up and at the time I used to drink then so I could have you know been a little bit giddy as well so and it was <laughs> the excitement of it as well for sure but I did I do uh, still get ribbed for the time I fell off um, fell off a stool eating a truffle That's amazing St stupid english person you know so <laughs> yeah anyway Brilliant. Um, yeah um, so i have just uh i mean it's been awesome so far i just have a, a few more sort of questions uh, arguably shorter sure. questions that just to round, round us out and see us yeah. through um so on the truffles then and, and eating them and you know there's a lot to be said for having them simply and uh can oh, you yes. can you share maybe one or two or three different ways that you like to eat your truffles, whether it is white truffles or, or white black truffles. truffles, maybe one yeah. simple way and maybe one way that I wouldn't okay. have heard of before. <laughs> um, let me think. Um, a simple, yeah, obviously, I mean, I'm just going to say probably the tried and tested ways of, mm. you know, eggs. But I mean, I think if you do scrambled eggs and make perfect scrambled eggs, I was trying to find the best way. And it was like one of, I think it was Ramsey's way of like doing it over a bain-marie. And then, mm. and I used truffle butter from the fresh white truffles. I put that in it and then shaved truffles and the eggs had been kept in Infused. with white truffles overnight. Yeah. And oh, it was just, again, it was nice. one of those other like fall off the seat moments. It was, oh God. Anyway. That sounds that good. One. Three three yes. different ways of yeah. getting the truffle white, into white your truffles. scrambled eggs. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. You've got to really, yeah, you've really got to really go for it, haven't you? And then um, with black truffles, with the summer truffles, I like to, I, I found a way to um, do a dry brined, um, dry brined chicken, spatchcock chicken. Okay. Do you watch, uh, how, you said you like cooking, work? do you like the yeah. basics with babish? You, you, do you know that no, channel? No, okay. on YouTube. Okay, on YouTube you mean? Good. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and he did a great dry brined chicken, and it just seemed to be perfect because, like, the salt gets right into the all of the fibers, and it tends to break down the fibers, and you get a crispy skin as well. And so I sh we had like a lot of like black truffles, 
and I made like a black truffle like paste, which was just like garlic and olive oil. And I shaved those and I put them in the skin, under the skin. And okay. I left that like overnight. And then I kind of like cooked that. Um, and that's called a black widow chicken, I think. Oh, wait, you have to it's take me like back one second. So the yeah. dry brine, how, how do you do it the dry, dry brine, brine bit? Okay, let's just cover it in salt. Yeah. Okay, and then you brush it all off after 24 hours. And just then, salt, no other like herbs or flavorings. No, or, just salt. No, just and then, salt. I, and then I, then I, so you dry all that off, and then I. This is a whole like, chicken, uh, or a whole chicken spatchcocked. Okay, I'm with you. Under the skin, you shave black truffles, shove it all under the skin. So, and then I'd also made like a black truffle paste, which, which is just, um, it was mashed up black truffle with a mortar and pestle, nice. garlic and olive oil i can't remember whether i had any rosemary in there as well and uh, no salt obviously it's going to be really salty anyway mm -hmm. and then i shoved that in between the flesh and the skin and then i left that for another 24 hours and then i cooked it was that with the slices of truffle as well under the skin with slices as well yes so the we slices went truffle. in there and then also the, the, also the, the black puree truffle went paste. on top, paste no, that, on top. That was inside as well yeah and um, oh, oh, inside okay yes and I mean, you could do either or, or both. Yeah, like, well, yeah, both yeah, is always pushing, the better answer. Pushing the boat out, yes, and then um, and then shaved a load of truffles like on the top of that. But that was lovely because it get a mm. really crispy skin. And even though like cooking truffles at like that type of temperature isn't advisable, somehow it didn't seem to be affected. I think as it just been sitting with the truffle mm. for twenty four hours, and then we've got some more truffles on the top, and it was just a really it was just a truffly delight. And um, nice. then my third one would be yeah. with the tuba bromale. We have uh, artichokes in our garden. And this was another recipe I saw on YouTube. Um, artichokes, black truffles, and cream, like as a pasta dish. Ooh, nice. Very nice. Very earthy. Very, but I'd use that with the, with the bromale. How would you, you have do that with some How did you well. cook the artichokes out of interest? Sauteed and then, like, Sauteed. with a little bit of like water and then cream. And um, I think I had some garlic in there. I can send you the recipe if you're interested. Mm. Once you find oh, truffles, it's very, very worth it. Very worth doing. Yeah. There was like earthy tastes, I think, and there's a really yeah. nice combination of tastes with the artichoke and the truffle. It just went really well together. And obviously, cream with your truffle. And I, I did something similar with the uh, with, with what you mentioned the spatchcock dry dry yeah. brine i didn't do the dry brine bit but i did a roast chicken but with um uh porcini sliced up and mm. mashed into a porcini butter and then oh. shoved, squirted that all under the skin oh. and on top that was um yeah that works well as well <laughs> yes but, um, yeah sounds perfect so my next question is what what is the book or or books that you've um given most as a gift and why, or what is, what is one one or two books that have greatly influenced your life? Doesn't necessarily have to be truffle books, but. Um, Secret Life of Trees, I've given that as a couple of gifts. Have you read that? Okay. I haven't, no, no. Wollenbaum, what's his name? Peter Wollleben, Wollleben, German guy. Okay. And that's just all about the underground connections of roots and things. So that's definitely something that I've given uh, as a gift a few times. Awesome, awesome. As for truffle books, I think I probably would say that um, what got me interested in like making videos and trying to compile like mm. trying to compile information was the book called The Truffle Underground by okay. Ryan Jacobs. I think it is Ryan Jacobs. Ryan or Rowan? Ryan Jacobs. And I think just that was all about the seedy side of like white truffles. And um, then I thought, actually, there's kind of an interest in this and maybe I should make some videos about our life. So I think that was kind of influential in that way. And also thought like people actually talking about this is always told, you know, you must say anything, don't tell anyone what you do or that actually mm. I probably could do that because it was in English. And 
Yeah, I, people, I people think wouldn't be on, that people wouldn't be that interested, and so nobody would ever really find out anyway. It's not like something that's gonna that, you know loads of people are suddenly gonna be. Massively we've mentioned this, haven't we? This this yes. dichotomy of you know keeping what you yes. do secret, I guess, in your yes. local area versus getting your name yeah. out there and stuff for the business and marketing. But yeah, no, I, I'm yeah. fully behind it. I, I I think your videos are great, and uh, you should definitely well, thank keep, you. keep smashing them out. Well, um, probably because I'm addicted to mushrooms and now truffle hunting. Yes, but of course. Yes. I think it's a lot very, of people are. It's a very small well. niche, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. But I think it's it for for me as well. It was just a, you know, oh, we've done this today. Well, let's have a record of it. This big truffle, mm. this other thing, and uh, just a it was just a way of kind of like documenting what we're doing. Which, yeah. Yeah, and and also also, you know, you think you know a lot, and then you realise you don't know much, and then you know, and things are changing like all the time, and you're discovering sort of like new things and we just hope that um we have enough time to discover more of this unknown world bef before it's kind of like too late you're kind of always mm. left with this and this is just because i'm getting older but you think you know will it be around like for our kids to enjoy um and it's a pity because we don't seem to even halfway understand it mm. and we might have lost it before we've like you saying before, the medicinal side or how these how these things work really. It's only now it's all about the secret life of life of trees. It's all about the communication between the trees, and it, it seems to be something which is fairly you know new. There's not a lot of studies have been done about it, and mm. let's just hope that it's all around us for many more years to come. Yeah, there's Let, um, yeah. there's a book I'd recommend to you actually. If uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, it's called Entangled Life by mm -hmm. um let me write it down entangled entangled life yeah um it's it's all about fungi and, and mushrooms and there's uh -huh. a little bit on truffles as well but it, it really goes deep on all the amazing yeah. different ways of yeah you know how fungi can survive in space in a vacuum mm -hmm. um you know how it how it's actually in a form of intelligence because it can navigate yes. through mazes to find you know mazes yeah. that they set up all all of these crazy things that you know is very actually very underreported when you think of it yes it's like um, we're just kind of like scratching the surface about aren't we really i think you know it's it's uh it is very fascinating um, yes another question i, I have for you and i'm oh, yes. I'm, te I'm testing out a couple of new questions on you so you might guinea pig a little bit but um uh, okay. This is taken from one of my idols, Tim Ferriss. But what purchase of $100 or pounds or euros <laughs> or less has positively positively impacted your life in the last six months or in recent memory? Um, and if you if it's something you can mention, the brand or specific or how you found it, or if a anything purchase, comes to mind. A purchase of $100. And what ever went? Uh, well, in the last recent memory that you can think of, something in that you've recent bought, memory yeah. that's impacted my life in a positive way. Um, probably my boots. Okay. Because Any special boots? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, um, they used to, uh, because I used to like slip down the sides of the, the slopes when I was truffle hunting, and these ones have got like really good grips, and it's made a great difference to my truffle hunting. And also, I think the discovery that woolen socks give you a better grip within your shoes as well in that the winter when you're traveling so what <laughs> socks and like some shoes with boots with like really good grips because my ones before i didn't realize they must have just been worn out so they they've definitely i think improved my truffle hunting and paid for themselves in my um the increased time i'm able to spend out hunting so awesome awesome yeah <laughs> um next question how has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for later success? Uh, do you have a favorite failure of yours? I think with our first dog, we, as I said to you before, you know, sometimes you, you can get to a stage where the dog just doesn't seem to be learning or you couldn't find the truffles. Um, with our very first dog, there was a stage where she wasn't learning. I think we were ready to like pack everything in, just think we just can't do this. Mm. This isn't going to work. Um, however, I think the fact that we, that that stage took so long was actually a, a positive thing because it helped us to understand a lot of problems that we'd come up against like later on. Mm. And the dog turned into a, a really good dog because we had spent a lot of time sort of 
um, at the stage where they went like finding truffles like out in the wild. Um, it became a superb dog. Um, so, but at, at the time I remember feeling just like how frustrated we, we felt and yeah, kind of like thinking about jacking it in, obviously I'm just, you know, really glad we didn't. And I think anything, you've got to be very patient and very persistent to, to do something like this as well. And so any failures which are helping you to cultivate patience are always going to be very useful further down the road, aren't they? For sure, for yeah. sure. I can definitely relate to the dog one. You know, I think yeah. um, any any newish dog owner is going to have yeah. some episode or period of yeah. time where it's not all going their way. Yeah, um, I was I was reading, uh, I was I was listening to, I think it was a podcast of one of the American truffle guys from um, Oregon State, I think. And he was saying, oh, I got this dog and like within two days, I taught, uh, taught them with some Q-tips and like some truffle oil. And I was thinking, what? two days you know it's like, yeah he was out finding them i believe him i think there will be some dogs that just pick up on it straight away it was a legato as well and they are very easy to train mm -hmm. but i don't think that that means that they make better truffle dogs they're just you know they've been bred kind of to do this yeah what, one uh, thing i read about them um because i i think from my little knowledge and experience i think you know most dogs if not all dogs if they have a decent snout shape could probably do mm -hmm. the the scenting bit uh mm -hmm. no problem i don't think there's much difference although i yeah. could be wrong there's probably people shouting at me bloodhounds have probably got more scent molecules yeah. than others maybe yeah. but um i think that the interesting thing that i learned was that the the, the legatos had had bred out of them the the mm -hmm. instinct to to hunt game and things like that so yes. i guess that made them more you know, yeah. less chance of uh, mm -hmm. bad experiences happening during a truffle hunt. I don't know yes. whether you've learned or read, you know the same thing, if that's true or not. But um, I'll say yes. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> it could be. <laughs> yes. Do your own research. Yeah. 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 Um, it's obviously they 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 are like very easy to train and um, yeah. and they're kind of like you know handy sized dog as well. I mean, we've got yeah. big dogs. So, I mean, this can present a bit of a problem, both in controlling them at times when they get overexcited, but also like transporting them and things it can be a, it'd be nice to have like yeah. a dog that would just fit in your, in your handbag, but at the yeah. same time, I don't think it would be up to very much, I don't know. Yeah, very you long. might struggle for that half a metre deep yes. white truffle. But, yeah. But yeah, so, no, that's awesome. Uh, I just have one last one for you. Do you have any uh, advice or words of wisdom that you would, uh, share with any new person to mushroom foraging or truffle hunting like what would you say to them yeah I would say like uh, keep it to yourself because to begin with people will will mock you <laughs> they'll be laughing at you so that's a good <laughs> yeah. reason to begin with later on when you start finding it they'll want to know where you're going so yeah uh, my that that's the best advice I was ever given was like don't tell too many people what you're doing it's very tempting when you first you, you find your first truffles, like to go out into the evening and go down to the cafe and say, look what I found, you know, you're very pleased with yourself. Um, and yeah, you, I think it's best just to be low profile. Yeah, yeah. As low profile as possible. That's what I'd say. Awesome. That, that's probably probably the best advice I, I would give. And of course, be, be very yeah. patient and and spend a lot of time getting to understand your dog because you're going to be working with the dog. Um, you know, you're going to be a partnership with them. So, yeah, yeah, awesome. Spend time working out what type of dog he is and let the dog get to know you as well. Do different things together. Yeah, I think that's the, that's one of the main things I've so far spent time with with Buddy is just you know deepening that connection and yeah, yeah. making him the most confident dog I can possibly make yeah. him. That's it. Get a, um, get a rapport going between you, you know, mm. so that's, that's Brilliant. probably, I say it, you know, I, I, um, I don't have too much wisdom because like we're just, it's a, uh, we're just going along and learning kind of like along the way. We're just at, you know, different stages. Well, right now, I beg so. to differ. Like you've got a lot of wisdom to share. I mean, one just needs to go and check out your yeah, uh, YouTube got some channel. Yeah, sure. some experience. Well, oh, thank you. And you've right. recently uh, changed the name of the YouTube channel. Yes. Um, so well, we, we were using the family name 
um, okay. which is Palagaja, but we have dropped that because people always go, what pa- Palagipi? Struggling with the pronunciation. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I think it's a yeah. good strategy, so, yeah. Yes. So especially, um, yeah, people who, um, yeah. So, so how can people find out more about you if they want to check out more of your stuff? Oh, on YouTube. Yeah, just have a look at the videos. Uh, we have a site as well, which is uh, Pelagaja Truffles. Just a blog. That started off just as a blog. And, and yeah. just to and if anyone that. if anyone has any um yeah, any questions, any questions, they can either email me through the blog or under one of the YouTube videos. It's very nice like to be building like a I mean that's one of the lovely things, isn't it, about the internet, about YouTube, just getting people who have a similar hobby together. I mean, yeah. It was like impossible to do really in the past. So yeah, and we don't we're not necessarily like in each other's areas do you know what i mean so yeah, like yeah. you're in england um i'm not so we can sort of like talk to each other more freely because we're not really rivals we're mm-hmm. comrades or something yeah that's my plan don't don't uh, yes. don't be a rival to anyone and just align with people that's brilliant um okay cool so okay yeah, julie julie it's been lovely to speak to you and uh thank you for your it time was today really nice talking to you ben and like good luck with everything and hopefully when i come to the when i come to the uk we could perhaps meet up or at least i could send you some truffles yeah that'd be fantastic i would love to yeah. meet up and yep. uh, experience and taste your truffles would be amazing yes, so, yes. cool all right take care for okay. now okay okay thanks a lot ben bye-bye now Thank you.